I want to go to Professor Greenwood, which is a professor to the Warwick University in UK. And uh, he is running different programs uh, related to the electromobility, including the uh, battery uh, lab research. Uh, Dave, are you there? I can see you. I am. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. The panel is now it's yours. Thank you very much. Please just let me share a screen. So I hope you're able to, uh, to see the slideshow. Yeah, now. we can see it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I was asked to speak today really around battery applications and what we see the future trends around batteries being, particularly in different transport applications. Um, and I think I'm going to echo to an extent the messages that Greg has given around where we see electrification fitting uh, and where perhaps it will be more difficult. So to start with, I'll talk about where we see batteries being applied and how. And I think the first message to say is that we can see a group of sectors now which has already got a strong strategy in place for electrification, which understands where it needs to go and which has a deployment plan which is being executed. And that's been led by automotive and the battery industry has sat up and taken note because of the enormous value and volume of the automotive battery market as we electrify the European vehicle park. But increasingly now we're seeing other sectors, motorsport, off-highway, air, I'll come back to in a moment, marine, two-wheelers, rail and heavy-duty truck coming forward with credible and e economic plans to electrify their platforms. The aerospace one, um, to be clear and agreeing with Greg's point really, short haul, four-seat, heli-taxi type applications, we can electrify with the battery technologies that we have around us today long haul intercontinental travel, the physics does not allow for that to be powered by energy stored in a battery on board the vehicle. So that's highly unlikely to come forward. But the aerospace industry does now have a clear electrification strategy, looking at small aircraft, medium sized aircraft and large aircraft in different ways. Perhaps a little bit surprising at the moment is that there are three sectors which are not driving the technology development of batteries in practice as hard as you might expect. One of them is large scale energy storage, and that's particularly associated with being able to buffer renewables on the grid and to shore the distribution network on the grid. A second is consumer electronics. Many of the devices that you will be watching this, uh, this broadcast on are powered by a lithium cobalt eight battery. That's the same technology that was patented in the 1980s by Sir John Goodenough and won him a Nobel Prize in a, a year or so ago. And military at the moment is looking to commercial off the shelf solutions to try and solve its problems of energy storage. And because of the very specific requirements for military applications, I think there's a real risk that that, that will not happen. So at the moment, the drive is coming from the transport type applications that you see at the top. But I can see what I refer to as the sleeping giants uh, in the three sectors that you see below, which I think have the, the opportunity to step forward and put new drivers and new innovation into the battery industry. And if you look at what the needs of these different sectors are, the question that each of these sectors ask is the same. How much does it cost? How heavy is it? How big is it? How long will it live? And how can I ensure that it is safe in operation? But the weighting that they put on the answer to those questions is very different. So for instance, if you look at an automotive application, if you talk to purchasing, they'll tell you that cost is everything. If you were to offer them a battery where it was a tenth of the price and one in, a million, one, in one million cells exploded at random, you'll quickly understand that actually safety is the number one priority for automotive and cost is then optimized within that. And volumetric energy density is actually more important to us than weight in an automotive application. There are ways of dealing with weight. Volumetric energy density fundamentally affects the packaging of the vehicle. If you contrast that with static energy storage, so maybe a megawatt scale battery, which is connected to a, a grid or a distribution network, you can accommodate safety by placing it in a remote location, by enclosing it, by putting fire suppression systems around it. You don't worry about the weight or volume of the system because it doesn't have to be packaged inside something that moves around on two or four wheels. 
But what you really care about, because these systems are so large, is the cost, and in particular, the total cost of ownership. And I'm not going to work through that argument for all of the sectors, but suffice to say that because all of these sectors have slightly different requirements, there is not one sort of battery which is going to serve all of their needs. And so you are going to see multiple battery trajectories emerging in the industry. And we've re recently done some analysis which looks at the targets that are needed in all of those sectors. And we found that you can group the battery requirements into four distinct strategic groups. The first group is focused on power density above anything else. Typically, this is used for things like energy buffering in large aircraft, or it is used for energy buffering in a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, where the fuel cell will provide the energy requirements of the vehicle, and the battery allows for short-term acceleration and strong regenerative braking. And here, the battery is a relatively small part of the overall powertrain, and therefore you can sustain relatively high cost per kilowatt hour or per kilowatt. And it's the power density which is the thing which drives it. The second category that we see is still a power focused battery, but these are now going into much more cost sensitive applications and typically very high volume. So these are the types of battery that you might find in a hybrid or a, or a mild hybrid vehicle in a passenger car today. The third cluster remains power and weight sensitive but really it's about how much energy you can store. And these are typically what you see as the drivers for cars, for motorcycles, and for some of the smaller vertical takeoff aircraft that we see. And that is the predominant direction that the battery industry has been developing, certainly over the last five years. And the fourth category is where the focus is still around energy, but really the cost sensitivity is much, much higher. And this is this stationary energy, uh, large-scale storage type programs that you see. And these four different groupings logically would have four different technology solutions. The question is around the affordability of that. So right now, if you look at what's being deployed in these large-scale grid applications, they're very often borrowing technology from automotive because the economies of scale of automotive make that cost effective. But if you were to design a system that was predominantly aimed to focus on those demands of, the energy, of these large-scale energy storage systems, you may well settle on a different technology. If we then take a step back and have a think about what is actually going to power the various forms of transport that we have, this very much ties into what Greg was talking about just a moment ago. For small light vehicle platforms, so for bicycles, cars, vans, and the lighter end of trucks, I think that the, the conclusion is electric is likely to be the predominant energy vector that we use for those forms of transport. And as the technology improves and the costs comes down, it becomes easier for us to do that. If we look at the long distance aerospace application, the, you know, the science does not allow for that to be a battery storage solution. And the, to the main energy provider into those industries is going to have to be things like biofuels and synthetic fuels. And those will be in limited supply. So we have to be careful that we don't look at things like heavy duty vehicles as being the predominant consumers of biofuel, because that will leave other sectors like aerospace with no viable option. And the most difficult tranche to satisfy is this section in the middle, which is typically the heavy duty vehicle. So 40 ton long haul truck and things like marine. And that's where the total stored energy on the vehicle is higher than a battery would normally allow. This is a particularly difficult area and hydrogen is one solution which may be attractive in that place. And I'll talk in a moment about what the, the pros and cons of that will be. But I do encourage us to think about of this in the context of an overall energy strategy, because energy isn't just about transport. We have many other uses of energy in our economy. And the really difficult one to solve is going to be heat. At the moment, if you look at the amount of energy we use in Europe for heating houses and for industrial heating, it's tremendous. And most of it is coming from gas and fossil sources. If we're going to truly decarbonize that, then we, must, we may have to ask a question about if we have sources of renewable hydrogen available to us, are they better used for transport applications or are they better used in applications like heat? 
So I'm going to talk particularly around the, for today, around the electrification path for these small vehicles moving up to the scale of trucks. I'm not going to talk particularly about the aerospace and marine side, although it is somewhere that our group is heavily active. So let's start at the small end of things. If you look at what has happened in many economies, particularly through the periods of lockdown and COVID-19, you've seen significant uptake in use of bicycles, electric bicycles. You've seen uh, pop-up cycle lanes all over cities to allow people to use these in a safe and controllable way. We've seen trials of things like electric scooters brought forward by years in order to give people personal transport modes which are clean and green. And you've also seen the motorcycle industry have something of a renaissance. Sales of scooters and motorcycles are doing very well at the moment, even against the backdrop of a pandemic. And social attitudes to these types of transport for small, for short journeys have changed. We don't know whether that's short term or whether that will stick, but there is certainly an opportunity which has been raised by that. And what that also does is open up a real innovation space around what personal transport is. I think we all have a good idea as to what a bike or an e-bike or a scooter looks like, but there are a huge number of possible solutions around that space which one could envisage and which could get people out of traveling in a 1.5 or 1.8 ton car and into traveling in a 50 kilogram, hello, sorry, and into something like a 50 kilogram uh, platform. The challenge that we have at the moment is that the regulation around us does not easily allow for this. It raises lots of questions. How old do you have to be to ride one of these? Do you need helmets? Do you need insurance? Where are you allowed to ride it on roads? Can you use it in cycle lanes? And these things are the, the questions that if solved properly will really allow a significant shift of transport from large and heavy vehicles into small and light ones. But my concern is that the, the regulations that are being put forward in the short term may not be the ones that encourage a large scale long term shift in this area. And if we take that the step forward, it also opens up some real opportunities for us to downsize some of the urban mobility that we have. Uh, so particularly if you look at the role for the L7 vehicle, the small electric vehicle, both for moving people and for moving goods around cities. And I think again here, this is an opportunity for innovation. What we need to look at is what can be done on the regulatory side. If we look at the L7 vehicle, the big question is what do we do around crash standards, for instance, in order to make these a viable alternative? Because these can get hundreds or thousands of kilograms out of the forms of transport that we drive today and significantly reduce our energy consumption. Moving up in scale and looking at the automotive industry, the electric cars that we see today look the way they do because of the environment in which they operate. Our charging network is relatively sparse. The battery technology that we have been employing over the last few years is still relatively expensive. That means that typically electric vehicles have been long range expensive vehicles capable of doing many hundreds of miles. And the consumer demand has been for more and more range through that period of time. But if we sit back and look at how we use cars, the graph that you show here shows the total number of journeys which are performed in the UK, and by the way, the EU is very similar, that are less than a certain distance. So you can read this graph to say that 98% of journeys are less than 50 miles, 99% are less than 100 miles, and 99.5% are less than 200 miles. Let me put that the other way. The size of the battery that you need on board a vehicle is proportional to the number of miles it's going to be able to drive. So if I was to, if I was to have a battery in my vehicle, which was capable of driving average trip distances of 50 miles, so maybe 150 miles total range, I could satisfy 98% of the journeys that are, are performed in Europe. To do the next 1% of journeys, I need to double the size of that battery. And to do the next half a percent, I need to double it again. So this is a real significant diminishing, a law of diminishing returns. And I think what you're going to see as the charging infrastructure, and in particular the fast charging infrastructure in Europe improves, is that this rush to larger batteries and longer range is, is not going to be the case. I think you'll see three categories of cars emerge. The first one is our suburban car with about 150 miles of real world range which can be satisfied in an efficient car with a battery of only about 40 kilowatt hours. 
and about $4,000 bill of material cost. And often that will be a second car or it will be used in addition to long range forms of transport, such as a train. I think you'll see a category of effectively the family car, the car that does still need to be able to do a 200 mile real world or 250 mile real world range with a battery of about 70 kilowatt hours at a cost of about $7,000. And you'll still see some premium cars with the ability to do many hundreds of miles, 300, 400, 500 miles range, but with batteries that are you know, commensurately large and expensive. But whereas the, you know, a significant tranche of today's electric vehicle sales are in this premium category, the volumes are really going to start to emerge at the lower end of this scale. And that means that our batteries become smaller and cheaper and they become faster to charge. And I think that's a significant trend we need to be aware of because at the moment, much of our technology focus has been about putting more and more range into vehicles. And I don't think that's going to be the predominant trend forever. So if you look at what we can do to meet those requirements, there are two predominant ways that are being done from the chemistry, the battery chemistry and the battery materials. The lithium ion batteries that we have around us today have significant room for improvement. We tend to focus today on high nickel materials like nickel cobalt manganese or nickel cobalt aluminium chemistries in order to give us long range. But we're seeing an emergence or a re-emergence of chemistries like lithium ion phosphate, which are significantly cheaper, not more capable, but cheaper per kilowatt hour. There are some things that we can do to improve all of these, like using silicon in our graphite anodes that will increase the energy density of those anodes. We can look to take out some materials around the separator. We can improve the electrolytes and those will give us better volume, better weight and better cost in our lithium ion batteries today. And the ultimate journey for that is to move to what's referred to as our solid state battery. So eliminate the separator and the electrolyte in a form we recognize it today and replace those and the anode component with a thin layer of lithium foil and a microns thin layer of a polymer or a ceramic material. But we're some way from being able to do that. And the technologies that I show here, you'll expect to see on the market from today over about the next eight years. Beyond that, we have some challenger chemistries. So sodium ion is particularly interesting. This is a chemistry that works very similarly to a lithium ion battery and in fact is made in the same way. So the same factories pretty much can make it but it takes out many of the sensitive materials like lithium and cobalt and replaces them with lower cost and more easily sourced materials. It provides a battery which is not quite as competent as the lithium ion battery we see today, but could be significantly cheaper. And so if we think about our suburban family car where I don't need to put 300 miles of range in and what I care about is making it as cheap as possible so many hundreds of thousands of people can buy it, that's where these types of chemistries will come. Beyond that, we see chemistries like lithium sulfur and further in the future, lithium air, magnesium and calcium. These really are chemistries which for automotive purposes are currently in the laboratory. And it is impossible to forecast how long it will take for them to come to market until we see them emerge from the, the laboratory. And that could happen in years or it could happen in decades. So these are certainly areas where research is well spent, but it is very difficult to judge when such a technology could be useful for automotive. But we mustn't lose track of the fact that battery improvements are not just in chemistry. There is a tendency to think that this is a chemical problem that needs to be solved and it's not. It is also a massive manufacturing problem. The majority of the gains that we've seen in battery improvement, particularly for cost over the last five years, have come not from chemistry change, but from improvements in the way that we manufacture the batteries. They've come from economies of scale. They've come from increasing yield. They've come from reduction of the amount of material that we need to use to get to a specific output. And that trend is absolutely going to be what powers the continued reduction in cost over the next five years or so for the automotive markets. The other area to look at is that the shape of the battery industry we see today and the shape of the battery product we see today is determined by the supply chain that produces it. And this has led to what I call the Russian doll problem. What we care about in the center of the battery is this electrochemical material that stores energy. And with today's supply chains, 
We package that electrode into a cell, which is basically a box. We package the cells into modules, which is basically another box. We put those modules into a pack, which is basically another box. And then we put that pack into a car, which is basically another box with wheels. And so this means that we've got an enormous amount of waste material in the battery pack, which is not performing the fundamental mechanism of storing energy. And it's there predominantly because of the shape of the supply chains and the economics of scale at the different points in those process. And I think the trend that you'll start to see now is what I term, term we're going from an onion structure to an apple structure. We're starting to see vertical integration of supply chains allowing us to blur the boundaries between these products. So you're starting to see much bigger cells going into packs. You're starting to see multiple cells going into one package, into one effectively cell. You're seeing much larger modules. You're seeing modules, modules becoming structural. And you're seeing a blurring between the pack structure and the vehicle structure. And I think the key message I have here is that actually it's not electrochemistry. It's mechanical, thermal, electrical, and manufacturing engineering, which is really going to power us through the cost reductions that we see in automotive over the next five to eight years. And you can see that starting to happen already. If you look at the sort of current state of the art, art pack, so this is something like an Audi e-tron, you can see here that structure I described earlier with lots of small modules, uh, with cells inside them going into packs. Uh, you'd see some, you, if you look at the Tesla Model 3, I think that's one iteration from this. You can see the modules becoming larger um, inside the same pack, but it's still a separable pack structure. And if you look at the VW ID, it's very similar. It's larger modules, but again, single cells that sit within that, single larger cells. Where this really starts to become exciting is when you look at some of the trends which are emerging around integrating cells to packs. And I've just picked two examples of what's happening at the moment that are difficult not to focus on. If you look at what Tesla is proposing about letting the body of the cylindrical cell start to take some of the structural load of the pack and making the structure of the pack the same as the structure of the body, and then effectively having bolt-on front and rear structures that move with that, I think it was really underestimated from all of the reports on Battery Day how significant a strategy change that is away from a skateboard and towards a structural element of a vehicle. And a similar trend that I've picked out here is the, the BYD blade cell. So these long modules, these long cells that you see here actually contain multiple electrochemical cells within them, but they are mechanically self-supporting and can be stacked into the pack structure at relatively low cost and start to share the structural properties between the pack and the cell. And I think these are just indicative of the types of innovation you're going to start seeing around cell, module, and pack construction. So lastly, I'm just going to talk about briefly about where I think heavy-duty electrification is likely to head, because I think this is the most difficult of the sectors that we face. If you look at what it takes to make a battery electric truck that is capable of traveling at 500 miles distance in a day, with a 400 kilowatt peak power and 100 kilowatts of average power, the battery that you need for that is nine tons, and it's $150,000 worth of battery. I just don't see, I'm afraid, that this is an easy solution for long haul applications, particularly if you then think about what it takes to charge that truck. Trucks are only doing work when they're moving. And so if we have to pause that truck to charge it, if you want to fast charge that truck in 30 minutes, you need a two megawatt charger for every truck that you're going to need to charge. And that's a significant electrical problem. And if you don't have it, then your alternative is that you're either having that truck stationary for many hours of the day and not productive. Or we need to look at novel schemes like battery swap, uh, which could potentially solve the turnaround side for time for the truck, but at the cost of having lots of expensive batteries floating around in an ecosystem. Hydrogen, from a user's perspective, really looks very attractive because to deliver that same performance, I would want to have a small battery that does acceleration and, and regenerative braking. I would want a moderate size fuel cell, which provides for the average load. And I would want a storage system that could keep about 30 kilograms of hydrogen on board. And so actually the on cost for the hardware in mass production is looking much more like $30,000 rather than $150,000.
And also theoretically, I could refuel this in five to 15 minutes. So from a user's perspective, this is really looking like, looking like quite an attractive option. The problem comes when we look at the amount of energy that our, our ecosystem has to provide to do that. If I take renewable electricity and I tend to send it into a battery electric vehicle via the grid, then typically about, about 69, for every 100 kilowatt hours of renewable electricity I start with, about 69 or 70 ends up at the wheels of the vehicle. So I waste about 30% of the total renewable electricity which was generated in the first place. If instead I look at taking that through any number of routes to get it to hydrogen and put it into a truck, unfortunately the losses along those lines are much higher. So for every 100 kilowatt hours of renewable electricity I generate, I only get somewhere between 19 and 23 kilowatt hours to the wheels. So I'm wasting 70, 75 to 80% of the total energy we produced. Or to put that in simple terms, for every one truck that I power on the road, I'm wasting enough energy to power four more. So it's difficult to see where this balance is going to come. From my mind, the most energy efficient solution to this is a catenary charging system, where each individual truck has a relatively small battery on board capable of powering the beginning and end of its journey. And the, the larger part of the energy usage, which is on trunk routes, is powered directly through catenary charging. If we do this, it means that the battery on board each vehicle becomes much more affordable. You know, 100 kilowatt hours, 900 kilograms, about $15,000. Um, and if you look at what that means in terms of the power provision, it's not as bad as you might think. It takes about 100 kilowatts on average per truck. So that means that for every kilometer of motorway we have to electrify, we need to provide about one megawatt. And to put that in context for the UK, we have about 3,500 kilometer of motorway so that would need about 3.5 gigawatts of electricity putting onto the grid that can provide in real time. And for comparison, at the moment, we're putting about two gigawatt hours of renewable energy onto our grid every year. So this is a difficult problem. It's an expensive problem, but it's not an intractable problem. Uh, and if you look at the cost of installing that, uh, that infrastructure in the motorway, it's about a million pounds per kilometre to put that catenary in place. So we would be looking at an investment somewhere in the region of 3.5 billion pounds. That sounds like a huge amount of money, but if you compare it to the amount of money that we're spending on putting a railway in place that goes from London to Birmingham, that's about 20 times that amount. So the challenge with this approach is that it needs simultaneous deployment by government, by infrastructure and by vehicle manufacturers. So I think in markets where you're able to di effectively dictate a route forward, this would be the most energy efficient and cost efficient solution to the problem. But if we have to rely on the market growing organically and without that kind of investment, then I think hydrogen fuel cell is probably the more likely of the routes to come forward. So in summary, I think our journey to electrification is reasonably clear for small vehicles and the most difficult unanswered questions are around larger vehicles and heavy duty trucks. And if we're looking at where innovation is coming in the future, I think that is going to be the battle, the strategic battleground for which energy source will dominate. And with that, I'll close and I'll be happy to take questions as you're ready. Thank you. Oh, uh, Dave, thank you very, very much. It was fascinating. Uh... All, all the three uh, speakers have been absolutely brilliant and extremely, extremely interesting.